Hi there, my name is Gerard Green. I'm a physiotherapy lecturer in Coventry University. I've been there for some time. And in addition to that, I work in uh, my own uh, physiotherapy clinic in Birmingham, in the West Midlands. And my uh, specialty is pelvic health physiotherapy. So that involves a lot of uh, patients who've got conditions related to pregnancy, a lot of patients who are postnatal, a lot of other female pelvic health conditions, some related to pregnancy, but some not, some lots of women who haven't been through pregnancy. And I'm also uh, really interested and passionate about male pelvic health physiotherapy. And my background is musculoskeletal and sports physio. That's kind of where I've, where I've come from. And I would like to say a really big thank you to Sheila. I've known Sheila for a very long time. Uh, and also a really big thanks to Michelle. And to thank them for asking me to uh, deliver this lecture to their uh, amazing uh, sports therapy students. This is the third year we've done this and each year has been different. Uh, the first year we did it, we did it in the strength and conditioning lab. So we did, I think we did about an hour. Uh, it was a very kind of informal uh, kind of discussion around pelvic floor dysfunction and sports therapy. Uh, last year we did it in one of the big kind of lecture theatres. And this year COVID-19 has uh, kind of appeared and uh, kind of caused a lot of changes to everything. So this year I'm, I'm doing it online. So I'm, I'm really happy to be able to do that and I think that probably the one advantage of doing it online is uh, is probably more people will even outside the university will will get to uh, maybe look through this so uh, so I've got a physiotherapy background I'm going to talk about some women's health physiotherapy so that's kind of pregnancy postnatal women's health and how that really relates to sports therapy and pelvic floor dysfunction and uh, if you have a think what the balls represent i won't leave you for too long otherwise you might end up going off and having a tea or coffee and maybe not coming back so the balls really relates to kind of men's health physiotherapy i think social media is really changing uh, i think up until a couple of years ago lots of people are on twitter whereas i think now i do much less on twitter Still do a lot on Facebook, especially around pelvic health, and do a lot on uh, Instagram. So if you're on any of those platforms, I'm thinking lots of you will probably be on Instagram. So maybe find me on Instagram and feel free to ask any questions, or if I can help in any way, or if you have some resources you found that you feel would be useful for your sports therapy colleagues, please. Uh, send them to me or post them to me so it's good it's good that we share this information so what type of pelvic floor patients or clients would you see so what might you've seen on a sports therapy placement or maybe what clients would you've seen maybe in the sports therapy clinic in the university or if you're a qualified sports therapist what what clients might you see in your day-to-day -day practice whether that's like a clinic treating the general public whether that's seeing more uh, sporting clients whether that's in a in a professional sports environment so what clients would you see that have a maybe a pelvic floor type dysfunction and i ask this to everyone i i kind of uh, have the pleasure of kind of presenting to or, or or teaching uh, because sometimes you're seeing these clients but it may not be obvious that they have a pelvic floor component whether that's a, a female patient or whether that's a male patient or maybe whether that's a younger patient that may be you know a teenage girl who's doing lots of dance or ballet um, you know so maybe if you have a think for a moment maybe jot down or I suppose people don't really write anymore and um, maybe stick it on your phone you know what in the last maybe six months or a year have you seen any clients where you think actually maybe they had a pelvic floor dysfunction 
And if we kind of see the giraffe here, sometimes the patients are there or the clients are there, but it might not be obvious that they have a pelvic floor dysfunction. So hopefully we'll, we'll, this is what we're going to really discuss. So what, what pelvic health is out there? Probably of interest to you guys is probably the uh, those clients who are, who are maybe quite active, maybe doing some recreational sport. So that's probably the male pelvic pain or athletic pelvic pain. So these are men who are maybe they're cycling, they're running, they're doing triathlon, they're doing football, rugby, and they're getting maybe mild pelvic pain. So getting maybe mild symptoms that's maybe started off as a groin problem or a back problem. But now if someone's picked up that they're getting symptoms into that perineum, that, that kind of soft underbelly in the pelvis, that, that area between the testicles and the rectum. Or it may be that someone's picked up that they're starting to get some mild urinary symptoms or mild erectile changes. So there's lots of those men out there. Maybe that it's some of the older men who've had uh, surgery for prostate cancer, but they want to get back playing golf. They want to get back playing maybe racquetball. They want to get back running. Uh, they want to kind of get back to what life was like before they had the surgery. And those men struggle with that because they all get urinary incontinence. So they struggle to do any kind of sporting uh, activity because they get urinary incontinence. The men we see in the clinic with a, with a, with a pelvic floor type component are a real cross section. So they're the younger guys who are doing lots of weightlifting, lots of heavy lifting, uh, lots of abdominal uh, work, to some of the more uh, middle aged guys who are doing maybe triathlon, biking, running, who are getting some more probably pelvic pain, to some of the older men who are coming in post surgery, post prostate cancer surgery. I think one big thing to take out of this lecture is that you do not have to have gone through pregnancy and giving birth to have a pelvic floor component. That's a real myth that's out there, that, um, that all female pelvic floor conditions are pregnancy related or postnatal related. A lot of them are, but you know, we see lots of women who haven't been through pregnancy, haven't been through that process of giving birth, but still have a pelvic floor component. So just because someone hasn't gone through that doesn't mean that they won't have a pelvic floor component. And I think it's very frustrating for those women uh, that who do have some of these conditions, such as maybe endometriosis, female pelvic pain, pelvic organ prolapse, bowel dysfunction, pain on intimacy. It's frustrating for those women when their condition is somewhat taken a bit maybe less seriously because they haven't been through pregnancy. That people think, well, you can't have a pelvic floor problem if you haven't been through pregnancy. So that's something to take out of this, that you do not have to have gone through that to have a pelvic floor problem. See lots of very sporty women. This is Gemma, who's one of my physios, who does lots of CrossFit, who's, who's also a mum. See lots of people who've been through pregnancy who want to get some, really get checked out, advice, what's safe to do, am I ready to run, am I ready to go back to Pilates, am I ready to go back to boot camp. See lots of women who are, uh, whose life is really affected by pelvic pain, lots during pregnancy. And I really like this picture. It's, it's kind of the, this is the reality of a postnatal body as opposed to maybe what we see on Instagram where people six, eight, ten weeks postnatal are very, have got that very kind of sculptured abdomen back, which is not the reality. Another big important kind of uh, uh, milestone for pelvic health function is the menopause. So we tend to see a lot of women uh, kind of peri-postmenopausal 
who start to either develop pelvic floor conditions or maybe they have a change in their pelvic floor condition. And, you, and you'll see those women as well. A lot of those women will be doing lots of sport and exercise. And we also see lots of children. I suppose of relevance to, to this, the sports therapy uh, clinician, it's really those very sporty children, uh, particularly the females. So the gymnasts, the ballet dancers, the tumblers, the trampolinists, uh, but other sports also where you're getting a real, doing lots of training, lots of high intensity impact work. So they will tend to get maybe a little bit of urinary leakage. Or they may be getting urinary frequency where they're having to go to the loo all the time. Or they may be getting a little bit of bowel problem, maybe constipation or a little bit loss in control of wind. So it's thinking about, well, do you, do you work in that environment thinking, well, now these symptoms don't sound like it's just that they've got like a muscular or joint problem. It sounds like something else is going on. And if you see postnatal women, if you see peripostmenopausal women, if you see women who have very stressful lives, who work very hard, who are balancing lots of work stress, doing lots of exercise, it's likely you'll be seeing women with pelvic health conditions. And similarly with the men, if you're seeing those young guys, the guys who are training intensively, or you've seen some of the older men maybe who are doing lots of exercise, but they've got lots of stress, lots of worry. A lot of them may have a pelvic floor component or some of the older men who've maybe been through prostate cancer. Which sports, it's kind of, as you'd expect, it's a real spectrum. You know, lots, uh, I think personally, it, it really it kind of depends, you know, what um, what's really involved. I suppose at the moment we see lots of cyclists, runners, triathletes, crossfitters. Uh, in terms of the women, similar, uh, a lot of body pump. A lot of British military fitness, a lot of boot camp. So I think pelvic floor dysfunction will span all those sports. Do sports therapists do pelvic floor work? Yes, they do. Probably not to the degree physiotherapists do. Um, but the thing that sports therapists will do is they'll see high volumes of these patients. So they have an important role in really screening, picking up these conditions. Uh, because, and we'll talk about this later, is that once you can pick up that someone's got this condition, it's quite reassuring to the patient because it starts to explain maybe the complexity of their symptoms. These can be quite life affecting conditions. So if you can also pick up, give some good quality information on what the patient should and should not be doing. And also if you can signpost them to someone who can help them, they will be really, really appreciative and they will remember you for that. This is a, a good friend of mine, Carl Monaghan. Carl is based in London. Carl is a sports therapist. Carl is one of the key people who sees a lot of male pelvic pain. So Carl will have done that whole remit of assessment um, management to include internal work as well. So Carl is a really good example of someone who's come from that sports therapy world. We now does a lot of very specialist male pelvic pain. And there are other examples as well. I've just picked Carl because he's, Carl kind of stands out because there aren't too many of us who do male pelvic health and there are even fewer males who do male pelvic health. So what's the pelvic floor and what does it do? It does a lot. And a really good way of finding out what it does, now that you possibly have more time to look at some of this stuff because of the, the move to online learning. So if you go to YouTube, if you go to Anatomy Zone, so it's Anatomy Zone on YouTube, there's some really nice clips on pelvic floor function and also on the pedendal nerve. So what I would really encourage you to do, they're about 10, 15 minutes long, I would look at the pelvic floor 
videos and also the pedendal nerve view. I would also look at the unicorn video. The unicorn video is important because it links really pelvic floor function with bowel function. It's also fun to watch. And at, in, during COVID-19, we could always do it a little bit of something that makes us smile. So let's just play this for a moment. This is Totally clean, totally cool. It stops in. I like the I like the squatty potty because it it highlights a couple things. It highlights the complexity of the pelvic floor, which is really important in bowel function. It's really important in urinary function. So if someone's looking at this lecture and they've got uh, maybe some uh, pelvic floor dysfunction, they maybe have urinary frequency. So they may, may have to kind of stop the video every half an hour. Don't worry, guys, we're not going to be here all day. They may have to stop the video every half an hour to, to go to the loo, or they may worry about going to the loo. Or if someone's got pelvic floor dysfunction, we know that the pelvic floor muscles are really important for uh, sexual function in females and erectile function in males. So looking at those videos gives you, will give you a real insight into what the pelvic floor does, how it can contribute to function and therefore dysfunction. And also you at some point may have to explain this to a client. And I know if you, when I explain this to, to patients or clients, it's not the easiest thing to do. So the more we know about it, the better. There is, and I think the bowel stuff is important because in the minute of COVID-19, people are sitting more, people are more stationary, people are more sedentary because we can't really go out of the house more. So people get are getting a bit more bladder or bowel dysfunction because uh, good bladder and bowel function need good movement. Pedendal nerve is important. There's also a really good pedendal nerve clip on that YouTube that I would encourage you to watch. The pedendal nerve is kind of the, the kind of forgotten uh, relative of, this, of the sciatic nerve. So it comes in that S234, comes through the pelvis, quite a convoluted route, and it supplies kind of what you're sitting on. So it supplies the perineum. So that's that soft area between the kind of genitals in front, rectum behind. It supplies the rectum, it supplies the female genitalia, and males, you kind of scrotum and penis but it also supplies the pelvic floor if you're sitting there and you think you know i think he's going to finish talking soon but i need to do a poo you could contract that kind of back passage that's the external sphincter supplied by the pedendal nerve or if you want to do a wee but you're thinking i need to finish this slide you can contract at the front which is the external urethral sphincter which is also the pedendal nerve so the pedendal nerve is very important for pelvic floor function because it, it helps, it's the motor supply to a lot of those muscles, but it's also got a big sensory supply. So check it out. Unicorns do exist. We've seen one. If we've seen it, it's real. Some typical patients, Rebecca. So Rebecca is someone who 
it was five months postnatal and Rebecca got in touch because she wanted to go back to exercise. She wasn't too bothered what she got back to, but she wanted to get back to something. But she was worried because she was five months postnatal and she wanted um, she was just having some difficulties. Her difficulties were she was getting some back pain. She felt she had a lot of weakness in her abdomen. And she also felt that she was getting some kind of pain on bowel movements. She wasn't getting any urinary symptoms, but she kind of had lost a bit of confidence in that she felt that she she felt she wouldn't be able to run. So we had a look at her and it ended up that she actually was doing really well, but she had a little bit of erectus diastasis, increased tummy gap. She had a very weak abdomen a very stiff lumbar spine and sh her constipation, if anyone's been constipated, they strain a lot. So that was causing a lot of pressure on her pelvic floor and that can contribute to kind of pelvic floor dysfunction or, or weakness. So she did lots of specific abdominal work, specific pelvic floor work, a lot of stuff to get her back moving and a very graded exercise program, which you guys are very good at. That's, you know, you, you that's what you guys do. So you, you can take someone who maybe doesn't, has been out of exercise due to injury, in this case pregnancy, get them back into it correctly. Louise uh, was, uh, or Louise is kind of mid 40s, works quite a stressful kind of job at the city, uh, big hours, big stress, lots of exercise. Uh, so she was having urinary frequency. She had to go to the loo all the time, but not voiding very much. She was having lots of pain and having sex. And she was worried about exercise because she just wasn't sure was exercise making it worse, was exercise making it better. And she was highly stressed about everything, but also about this. And also worried about that uh that you know she was still a very young woman but this was getting much worse hadn't been through pregnancy uh, and also couldn't understand really that if she hadn't been through pregnancy how is this happening to her because she thought well you can only get a pelvic floor problem if you've been through pregnancy she ended up having an overactive pelvic floor that's really that that pelvic floor is a little bit in spasm so contracts, forms a cuff around the vagina, contracts around the vagina, becomes very difficult to have anything enter the vagina, um, very painful, becomes very hypersensitive, allodynic, hyperangesia, um, and it also creates an irritation around the bladder, neck and urethra, so that feeling of having to go to the loo. So with Louise, she ended up doing she didn't do any pelvic floor strengthening, she did the opposite, she did lots of pelvic floor relaxation lots of breathing lots of kind of less intensive exercise a lot of movement based exercise and lots of headspace mindfulness daniela was one of our gymnasts a really high level gymnast and her problem was that she was getting urinary frequency she felt she had to go all the time she was getting some bowel symptoms constipation lack of just couldn't uh, evacuate fully there was always a little bit left which meant that she was soiling a little bit she couldn't get clean and also which kind of became a source of fun to her teammates which she kind of talked but didn't like was that she was breaking wind a lot when she when she trained um, and she had also a, a really, th th these women are not weak, they are, they are incredibly strong. She had a really overactive pelvic floor actually. So her work was not to strengthen that, but to try and do some work to relax that a little bit. Alan was one of our brilliant uh, post prostatectomy men. So he had his prostate removed. If you, if you have the prostate removed, you you that automatic continence control system is gone. So he wanted to get back running. So he did a lot, he did a lot of strengthening, but a lot of functional strengthening, a lot of pelvic floor strengthening and standing, squatting, lunging, a lot of abdominal work, a lot of graded return to exercise. Sam is a really nice young guy when I used to work, when I used to drive down to the clinic in Southampton. Uh, Sam was early 20s, physically very strong, did a lot of, uh, you know, lived in the gym, 
four or five times a week and he uh, he was a little bit obsessed about contracting his abdomen all the time a little bit focused on contracting his pelvic floor all the time so he started to develop a little bit of pubic symphysis pain which then uh, became into rectal pain then he got some penile pain and then he had stopped weightlifting so it's almost like his muscles went into a little bit of spasm internally but he did really well show up with one of our other probably more middle-aged patients he got in in touch uh his problem was he was getting lots of penile perineal pain pins and needles but quite nasty on cycling and he had to give up cycling but he got back cycling he had a male pelvic pain What's pelvic pain? So let's think about the sports clients here. Uh, so it's not malignant. These 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 men or women have been through extensive screening. They they will have seen a urologist or probably two or three, probably a colorectal surgeon, spinal specialist, sexual health specialist. So these patients are heavily screened by the time they they get through to us, <clears throat> or maybe that you pick up. But this sounds like something that that Jared spoke about in in that pelvic floor lecture. So they're getting pain in that pelvic area, whether that's pubic symphysis, lower abdomen, perineum, rectal, vagina, vulval, uh, penile scrotal areas. But they're also getting urinary symptoms. Frequency, changes in flow, little bit of post-dribble, bowel symptoms, sexual symptoms, <clears throat> maybe pain on sexual activity, it may be uh, with the men post ejaculatory pain is common. And also you get a lot of cognitive behavioral emotional components. So what are we looking for? We're looking for one. Well, it, it, the typical presentation here is, is initially it was, it was seen as this patient's got a hip or groin problem. They've got a pubic symphysis. Uh, uh, They've got uh, an abdominal strain. They've got a groin strain. They've got back pain. They've got a sacral iliac problem. And lots of people have that. But for some reason, things don't get better. And things get worse. And they then mention that they're also getting pain. Testicles, vagina, perineum, rectal. They're getting some urinary symptoms, bowel, sexual health symptoms. Often aggravated, ag aggravated by sitting, pressure through that perineum, that pedental nerve, Abd lots of abdominal work. And they don't like pelvic force strengthening. Makes them worse. They will say that they're, maybe they feel like there's, like if someone with pelvic pain is watching this lecture, they won't, they will be watching it in standing. They don't like sitting because they feel they're sitting on something or they feel that there's something in the rectum, like a golf ball. Get lots of penile symptoms in the, the men. Uh, hypersensitivity, it's hypersensitive to touch. They don't like tight underwear. Maybe getting pins and needles. They may lose their morning erections. It's just, that's a common thing that happens. The erection is weaker, it looks different, the penis may look a bit retracted, it's just physically changed, get lots of ejaculatory pain. Vaginal symptoms, oval symptoms, pain on intercourse, pain on using tampons, pain on masturbation, uh, sensitivity changes, it can be hypersensitive, hyposensitive, that may be vulval, clitoral, internal. Real feeling of tightness, like this vaginissimus, that kind of collar of muscle contracts around the vagina. Changes in orgasm, maybe an inability to orgasm. And that this is a, a change post the onset of the condition. Or that there is this persistent arousal syndrome, which is a very distressing uh, condition to have. Or vaginal atrophy, where the tissues change, they get a bit more fragile, a bit thinner. Vaginal dryness, lack of moisture. That's particularly what you see in some of the, you, you can have that postnatal, but very common around uh, peri postmenopausal. 
it's good to use the questionnaire so if you look on google google has all the answers you're looking for the nih national institute of health male and female pelvic pain questionnaires that's a good starting point if someone rings us up from a sports club and say i've got a person who i think has got a pelvic floor problem but i don't want to ask them those questions because you know i see them every day it's a bit awkward we would say okay give them this questionnaire get them to fill it in if they're taking yes to a lot of the questions it's likely they have a pelvic floor component and that nih questionnaire asks about urinary bowel sexual health symptoms but they have to just fill it in and then we will go okay it looks like there's a pelvic floor component there we can see them for you the patients are hugely relieved when someone asks about this and i think another thing to take out of this lecture is that if you pick up that someone maybe one of your back pain patients has got urinary symptoms or they're talking about constipation a lot if you can send them to someone who can help them they will be really really appreciative because these are awful conditions to have to live with it affects quality of life it affects relationships it affects activities socializing because if you're the person who suddenly directs or signposts that person to someone who can help them they will they will uh, identify you with the recovery so athletic pelvis and urinary symptoms this is possibly not what you expect tends to be urinary frequency we are not looking at lots of uh, urinary incontinence especially with the more very fit strong healthy women it's urinary frequency having to go to the loo all the time urinary urgency where they have to go automatic they have to go there and then the people who get urinary leakage in excess that not all not all of us but that tends to be maybe more of the postnatal returning to exercise and also maybe some of the postmenopausal women So some are, have got a weak pelvic floor, some have got an overactive pelvic floor. Now that's more complex than I've explained, but I think it's a good starting point. Pelvic floor dysfunction in female athletes is very common. Some are up to about maybe 50, 60%. Gymnasts, trampolinists, tumblers, dancers, if you're treating those people, if you see those people, most of those will have pelvic floor dysfunction. If you're seeing a, a big group of women who are returning postnatally, uh, most of those will have a pelvic floor component. There is very little research on men. What you're looking for men is really that. So say the footballers we see, the rugby players, the runners, the cyclists, it, uh, a big symptom is pain changes in erectile function the sporting population especially when it's not very close to that postnatal period tends to be overactivity that pelvic floor is working too much if it works too much it is not working properly it's a bit like i would give the analogy if someone comes in with an, uh, a calf that's in spasm they're not going to be able to to uh, do lots of heel raises, to run, to sprint, to decelerate. So that muscle is not going to work very well. Same goes for the pelvic floor. Pelvic girdle pain is a very debilitating condition. That's kind of pain around the pelvis, around that kind of sacroiliac joint, sacrum, maybe pubic symphysis, low back during pregnancy. And that's something that there's lots can be done to help those women. And then some will continue with that pain postnatally. And there is lots that can be done to help those women also. So it's really thinking, well, you know, this is not, I'm, this may be outside the remit of what I can do. You know, I may not be happy seeing someone who's got 
low back pain or sacral pain during pregnancy but you have to find someone who who in your local kind of community who can see those women because if they ring you up and they say i've got i'm 32 weeks pregnant i'm struggling to walk around because i've got read if you you can say one of two things to them you can say to them well you can say one of three things i can see you i have the specialist qualifications to see you what most people say is sorry <clears throat> you're pregnant i can't see you or you could say well i can't see you myself however i've got a colleague who can see you and i'll give you their details and i'll tell them that you've been in touch and they will go that's amazing i really appreciate that because i have been struggling to find anyone who's willing to see me rectus diastasis I think with Instagram, there's a lot of pressure on women that they should look like this postnatally. I think Princess Catherine's photo was really important after the birth of their first child, where she appeared outside the hospital uh, in a very, I suppose, a normal, a, in a normal photograph of someone who's maybe two, three, four days postnatal, who's still got quite. A prominent abdomen so that's the norm this is not my wife had twins and this is not the reality you know in our house there were not loads of there weren't loads of flowers and stuff and veils and stuff like this kind of more chaos but this is normal kind of postnatal tummy where you've got a real kind of range of uh, what that abdomen uh, abdominal musculature looks like and feels so rectus diastasis is where you get an increased width of the linea alba that's that kind of midline midsection between the right and left rectus and really we look at a diastasis as where you've got a two finger gap two centimeter gap when the abdominals are contracted. So that someone's lying in supine on their back, they do a head lift, you measure the linea alba, is it greater than two centimeters? They probably have a rectus diastasis. Not a straight, obviously it's not as straightforward as that, but the, the women you're trying to pick up as well, do, does someone have a three finger gap? Do they have a four finger gap? If they have, that would indicate that they've got a lot of kind of weakness in that abdominal container or that abdominal wall. So that has that has implications for what exercise they should be doing. We look for doming or uh, protruding. So if they come into a head lift, if the, the center of the abdomen is protruding out, that's doming, that's not a good sign. And really then, they shouldn't be doing exercises that's bringing on that doming. So for those women with maybe a three or four centimeter finger gap who are getting doming on head lifting, so they shouldn't be running. They shouldn't be doing quite strenuous exercise. They shouldn't be doing planking sit-ups. They have to do more gentle exercise to kind of get that abdomen working better, to get rid of the dome and to get more co-contraction. So I think what's important with those women, I think it's important with every postnatal woman, whether it's six weeks postnatal, whether it's six years, to check the rectus abdominis, to check the linea alba, to check the gap. So you get, so you could do this in yourself now. Find the linea alba, so between the midline, right and left, right and left rectus, Maybe do it in lines, and we'll replicate how we do it in a patient. So find the gap above and below the umbilicus, so you can do one at a time. Lift your head up, and probably with the guys, you probably will get maybe four or five millimeter gap. The women who haven't been through pregnancy, especially, I think a lot of sports therapy students are on the young younger side, so a lot of you are probably, you know, late, maybe early 20s. Uh, I know there will be some mature students in there, which is, you know, which is good also. Uh, but if you haven't been through pregnancy and you do some exercise, that in females, that uh, in an oliparous population would probably be about seven millimeters. If you've been through pregnancy, that can be up to about up to about two centimeters normal. 
So it's good with all of those women, all of those women who've been through pregnancy, irrespective of when, check that gap. If they've got a two, three, four finger gap, that's, that needs to really be looked at. That needs to be addressed, especially if they're exercising. So what questions can you ask all of the postnatal clients? And it's good, another good thing to take out of this lecture is once postnatal, always postnatal. So it's not that we just check all of this stuff if we see them in the first couple of months. You know, we will have patients presenting to the clinic. You know, I had one woman several months ago before we kind of closed for face to face uh, who had uh, her, her kids who were mid teens. She had urinary symptoms, but she'd never done anything about them because life was always too busy. Mums tend to prioritize everything else over themselves. Sometimes these women wait a long time to come, so it's good to, to check. But it's also to it's also to remember that we say, like we said at the start, not all pelvic floor problems are pregnancy related. Women can have pelvic floor dysfunction without having been pregnant. It's important to, to remember that. But I think you've got to start somewhere with pelvic health, and sometimes starting with the postnatal group is somewhat easier. So this is stuff we're going to ask about pelvic pain, prolapse. Urinary symptoms, pelvic girdle pain can look a bit, rectus diastasis, bowel. And then like anything, you know, your, cons your aim with a, a lot of clients, I'm sure, is getting them back to sport and exercise. And, you know, you have a lot of expertise in that. You know, you, you would work out, well, what have they done before? What are they currently doing? What do they want to get back to? <clears throat> so some good questions for rectus diastasis. Are you, ex are you experiencing abdominal weaknesses? Is there dome in your bulging? Are they getting pain? Have they had this before? Have they, have they noticed a gap? Is it worse than exercise? What are they doing for it? Pelvic pain. See, this, this, oh, this is some, some work that's been done by a colleague, uh, uh, Jane Chambers, who's in Australia. Now, Depending who you're asking these questions to, you would modify it. So we've done a lot of work with some young gymnasts. So with them, we're not going to be asking about levels of intimacy or sexual relations. That's more for an adult population. So you kind of modify depending on what, what patients you have in front of you. But adult female pelvic pain levels of symptoms with levels of intimacy or sexual activity another thing to take out of this is sex should be pain free sex should not be painful are they getting lower abdominal symptoms intestinal symptoms sometimes this comes hand in hand with irritable bowel how is it affecting them? I say to all my patients, how is this affecting you? Is it, how is it affecting you? So, and, and also another good thing to say to these clients is, well, if I'd seen you before this started, who would I have seen? And they'll go, a very different person. Are there symptoms using tampons? And is sitting a problem? Do they have to have they brought a cushion with them? Do they bring a cushion? You know, the people people with pelvic pain carry cushions around. And then we know the common area symptoms into that pelvic area. Prolapse is where there's some change in position of the pelvic organs. This can be mild, it can be severe. I think we're probably more concerned about the milder types. I think the more severe, where there's actually maybe protrusion out through the vagina, where there's really protrusion into the vaginal um, space, those people won't probably make their way to you. They'll, they'll probably be at the GP and under their uh, kind of GYN, as they say, and say it's their, their gynecologist. But it may be that they're getting, it's postnatal, they're getting mild pressure. And what we're asking for is, do you feel any heaviness or bulging into the vagina? 
When does this happen? Returning to sport and exercise postnatally. Sport and exercise postmenopausal. Post constipation. So those big three things menopause, constipation, postnatal. If you have women in those three categories who are having problems with exercise or they want to go back to exercise, you have to ask about this. Because they may say, well, oh, I'm going back, I've gone back to boot camp, but I'm getting lots of back pain. And but you know they they've been they had a baby six months ago. So you have to say, well, are you getting any internal pressure or internal pain? Or do you feel that there's anything bulging into that into your vagina? Urinary symptoms. So this is stuff we've kind of talked about. Another thing to take out of the lecture is that urinary symptoms, whether it's incontinence or leakage postnatally, is not normal. It's common, probably one in three, like we've got in the photo on the kind of title page. It's common, but it's not normal. It is relatively easy to treat. Bowel symptoms. Bowel symptoms are common. We've seen the unicorn. We have, uh, we're starting to think about the link between the pelvic floor. So bowel symptoms, we have to ask about those. When you have some time, if you Google the Bristol stool chart, maybe do it post meal, and it'll tell you the different types of poo you can have and what that means. We ask about that also. We're also trying to work out from the information this patient gives us, is the pelvic floor overactive? So that's your typical sporty, sporty female, high intensity exercise, or the person who's got loads of stress, loads of exercise, loads of pain. And this is some work that's been done, how we kind of define if it's overactive. Is it underactive? That's where it's weaker. Now, there, there are exceptions to this, there are exceptions to this, but generally, we will probably have a more of an underactive, weaker pelvic floor postnatally or postmenopausal. But but there are exceptions to that. But I don't want people kind of messaging me saying, "Oh, you you're just saying that everyone's underactive." So there are there are ex exceptions. But as a starting point, it's kind of a good starting point, I think. So what do we do, or what could you do? I think what your role is, a big role is, one hopefully maybe if, you, if you're still maybe in the final year of the course you might think well this is something i'm interested in what could i do to get a, a postgraduate qualification in pregnancy or postnatal uh, work so being able to see pregnant or postnatal patients or well is there something that i could go on and do is there like a qualification i could do in like in in maybe female pelvic floor dysfunction so that's one thing I hope this might inspire you to do. Or it, you might start to do some further reading. Thinking, well, I'm probably seeing these clients. How could I pick up that they actually have a problem? And then I could start to advise them. So someone's getting loads of bulging in their vagina when they're exercising. That's not a good thing. I could advise them. Well, they need to step that down a good bit. Or someone's got a four finger gap and they're doing loads of planking. So that's not good either. Do you have someone to refer them? So let's say you listen to this and you're, you're already working. So do you have someone you can refer those women or men to? And it is good to, I'm, I, I'm a big believer in collaboration. I work with some brilliant uh, pelvic health physios. I've got a big network of physios, sports therapists. We train them. Uh, we work with them. And what happens is one of them will, someone will contact them or they'll, they'll pick up in the clinic that something is going on pelvic floor. They'll say to that patient, I think, you know, you've got a pelvic floor component as well. They will send them to us, or maybe that they're working somewhere else, Manchester, they'll send them to one of our colleagues up in Manchester. And then two things happen. 
that client is very appreciative that their sports therapist has picked up that something else is going on. The physio or the specialist pelvic health physio will look after the pelvic health component, but that patient or client will still go back and see the original sports therapist for the sports therapy related condition. And this works very well. And this also takes a bit of trust. So I see lots, I have lots of physios who send us patients. I have lots of sports therapists who send us patients. But those patients don't then come back and see us if they've got a calf strain or if they've got neck pain or they've done something in the gym. We are seeing them for a pelvic health condition. And then if those, if we have people who come to us and go, uh, you know, I need to see a sports that we will say, well, we, we then can just redirect them to you. So collaboration is key. If you look on the website, there is a media section. Uh, there's a really nice podcast in there that, a, that my good friend, Dr. Ruth Jones did. She talks about combining pelvic health, musculoskeletal education. That's kind of what we do with these, with these patients. We do lots of what you would look on as normal musculoskeletal sports treatment. We do some specialist pelvic health stuff, do lots of education. So the podcast, so good, there's some good stuff in there. I'm not just saying that because it's my website, but it is, there is some good uh, patient focused and therapist focused content in there. And then if you also look on YouTube, so on YouTube, it's Gerard Green. There are some really nice videos in there. Some are patient focused, some are therapist focused. Second referral, that really is relating to the patient maybe that's been sent to us from someone else. So we do lots of lumbar spine stuff that will be very familiar to you. Emphasis really on referred pain. You know, is it reproducing some of those symptoms? Do a lot of pain provocation tests around that pelvis sacroiliac joint. We palpate the pubic symptoms. This is not difficult to do. You palpate this with the thener, hyperthenar eminence. You, you can do it on, well, it's hard to do it on yourself unless you're very flexible. You can do it on yourself. Uh, so you put the, the, the fingers are pointing towards the head. That's the key thing, really. Fingers are pointing away from the pubic symphysis. You gradually palpate below the umbilicus till you reach that pubic symphysis. It shouldn't be tender. It shouldn't be painful. It shouldn't produce referred pain. I think what you, what you guys will really like, do a lot of abdominal palpation. Palpate into that rectus abdominis obliques looking for referred pain normally when you palpate if you palpate yourself you can you know lots of people with covid so, some are some are more active some are less active sorry i was palpating my own tummy there and kind of wiped the screen out uh, so we're, we're looking for a nice soft abdomen shouldn't be painful we're looking for referred pain typically you press in it feels a bit more solid you get referral into maybe the pubic symphysis you get referral into the kind of vulval rectal area. Do a lot of hip assessment. And we examine the pelvic floor probably in two ways. First way is really externally. That's getting the patient to do some pelvic floor contractions. Is it easy for them to do? Can they hold it? Does it feel comfortable? Um, we also look at a, tr a transabdominal ultrasound. So we put an ultrasound probe, a bit like they do in pregnancy. Lower abdomen, this space here is the bladder. Pelvic floor lies down here. When you contract the pelvic floor, this elevates, relaxes, depresses. And we do it, we do two tests. We do quick tests. So can they do a fast pelvic floor contraction? So you contract rectum, front, maximum contraction. So you contract, almost stop yourself passing wind. Stop yourself passing urine. So you contract, lift, maximum contraction, let go, maximum contraction, let go. How long does it take them to do 10 repetitions? Try this yourself. It should be less than 10 seconds. Then we do a slow twitch fiber test. How long can they hold a slow, a slow contraction for? So that's where you get them to contract back and front, probably about 50% effort. How long can they hold that for? You guys do it, you're fit and healthy. You should probably be coming in somewhere around 50 seconds. The patients who are weak struggle to do it. Patients who are overactive can do a few contractions 
and then they can't relax. So they'll say, I've contracted, but I can't relax. That's maybe indicative of more overactivity. And then with some patients, we would progress to do an internal examination, but not all. A lot of this stuff is external, but with some patients, they will progress to having an internal examination, but not all patients. What is the management? Well, as you can expect, you know, it, it depends what the problem is. But the big thing is education. Education about the pelvic floor, pedendal nerve, maybe about diastasis, uh, pelvic girdle pain patients, postnatal patients, they're, they're um, very anxious, catastrophize about the pubic symphysis being unstable. So we talk about that that's a very stable region. We talk a lot about, a bit like the unicorn, how pelvic floor function is related to bowel, urinary sexual function. Lots of men, Any if, if there are any men listening to this, which there will be, because you know we have lots of male sports therapy students, we have lots of sports therapy clinicians. Uh, when you get an erection, it kind of needs three things. It needs an intact nerve supply, blood supply, it needs a good pelvic floor function. Poor pelvic floor function, poor erectile function. Talk a lot about the role of stress anxiety. And I know we haven't really touched too much on that because of, because we, you know, we, we can't cover everything, but stress and anxiety is a massive part to play in this. Uh, uh, lots of people are watching uh, Tiger, uh, Tigerland, Joe Exotica. If you're constantly stressed, you're constantly work going at 100%, that analogy of being chased by that tiger, constantly stressed, lots of adrenaline. That's not conducive. That's not conducive to good bowel, bladder, reproductive health. It's also not conducive to good muscle function because it causes a lot of overactivity. So we spend a lot of time, whether it's a postnatal condition, whether it's a male pelvic floor, female pelvic floor, going through a lot of that relaxation, mindfulness, uh, doing exercises that kind of get more of a parasympathetic activity, less of that intensive exercise. And we get them reading about pelvic floor dysfunction. And this is particularly important at the minute. You know, we're in this kind of pandemic of COVID-19, uh, lots of stress, anxiety, worry uh, for, for multiple reasons. Uh, pelvic health patients, you know, patients with chronic illness, uh, chronic pain, this is not a good time for them. So things that we use with patients is headspace. Headspace is excellent. Uh, maybe get them doing some other online meditation, get them to do uh, meditation class, uh, some, something really that they will engage with. Do lots of abdominal, lots of soft tissue work that you guys will do, uh, lots of around the abdomen, maybe the QL, uh, posterior hip, just, and then we also get them doing that themselves. We get them to, to self-treat a lot. The wand is something we use internally, but the one end of the wand is a bit bigger, the big end of the wand, as we call it. And that's also quite good to do some of that external uh, soft tissue work. Do lots around the, the thoracic, lumbar, hip. Just It's really getting it moving, I suppose, getting, getting, getting some movement into those areas. Get them doing a lot of down training. These are for the overactivity. Best way of getting this pelvic floor relaxation moving it's doing lots of abdominal breathing. So if you do this now, you've got one hand in your sternum, one hand in your abdomen. Take a nice big breath in, doing some belly breathing. Diaphragm descends, pelvic floor descends. Get some movement into that area. Get people doing that for 10, 15 minutes a couple of times a day. But they will only do that if they understand why they're doing it. And we, we kind of demonstrate that to them on the ultrasound. So we show if you do the breathing this way, that pelvic floor will move a little bit. Uh, if they don't understand it, they don't really, won't really do it. And we also get them doing what's called a reverse Kegel. Tricky to do, but you have a bit of time now, guys. You can practice this over the next week. So you're on, you're sitting there. What you're going to do is take a nice belly breath in. 
as you're breathing in, you're going to very gently apply a little bit of downward pressure through the back passage. Almost like you're gently pushing that back passage into whatever you're sitting in, but emphasis on gentle. You hold for a couple of seconds, do about 10 repetitions. So a little bit of gentle reverse Kegels. It's like a focus stretch. <clears throat> and then get them to do lots of breathing. Lots of, uh, get them to do lots of lumbar spine, pelvic movement, hip movement, gentle stretching, getting them out, getting them exercising. As appropriate. Who needs to strengthen? Some of those postnatal women may need to strengthen. Possibly some of the postnatal weakness, particularly with urinary incontinence, uh, stress incontinence, the post prostatectomy men. So we get them doing slow contractions, fast contractions. What's really useful for patients doing this is the squeezy up. So if you kind of look up squeezy up on your phone. But, but these muscles have to work in weight bearing functional positions. So we try and move away from doing pelvic floor exercises on the bed or in line. So we get them doing them in standing, kind of wall standing, squatting, lunging. So have a go at this. Get into standing. Do a slow twitch pelvic floor contraction. Maintain it. Try and maintain it when you're doing some squatting or some forward or back lunges. It's not easy. And, and you guys are fitting well, have a good understanding of what you're doing. So for patients, this is difficult to do, but they have to do functional strengthening. And then you then once they've got a good pelvic floor contraction, you combine that with abdominal activity. So hopefully we've already found those muscles. <clears throat> but I think you cannot explain this stuff to patients <clears throat> unless you can do it yourself. And it's not easy for us to do it either. It takes a lot of practice. There'll be a lot of like, like you know, I've seen you guys, you know, around the university. You all, a lot of you look very fit and healthy and strong, like you do lots of exercise. So some of you will probably struggle to do some pelvic floor contraction relaxation because it may be that you're overactive. But if you're not symptomatic, that's fine. It's a bit like you have, you know, if, if anyone's got really well developed kind of uh, abdominal six pack, very toned, sometimes those people struggle to do some of this because <clears throat> it's almost that they've got quite high level of contraction in there. And a bit like I've said before, <clears throat> I, I, I haven't been able to see you in person, which is, is a real shame, but you know, we've been able to uh, circumvent that and do it in another way. But I, I would be really keen to connect with you on Twitter, uh, Facebook or Instagram. And but please, I think one of the one of the good things about doing this live in a in a, in a, a lecture theatre or, or a lab is you get lots of interaction from the people there. And I know last year and the year before, you know, people talked a lot about, you know, clients that they'd seen or um, their experience of what they'd come across clinically. And I think, you know, Michelle, Sheila and I really want you to do that. So maybe a way you could do that is maybe just send us some questions on social media. Uh, I'd like to thank Sheila and Michelle for the invitation to do this. It's it's truly an honour to do it. Uh, I'm a big believer that more people need to get involved in pelvic health and more sports therapists need to get involved in pelvic health because you guys see a high volume of patients. You'll be seeing a high volume of patients who are in sport and exercise who will have conditions that, that will be affecting their ability to do those things or to do other uh, <clears throat> things affecting their quality of life. And uh, this, is a, this is a difficult time for both students in the university. Uh, it's a difficult time if you're a sports therapist and you're working, because you're probably not working at the minute, uh, or you may be doing some online work, but it's, you know, it's, it's a challenging time for, for a lot of people in the uh, sports therapy, physiotherapy world. Uh, so my thoughts are with you all, uh, and hopefully, uh, in the not too distant future, we're now at the end of April, that we will have moved back to a new normality. So uh, thank you again. It's been a real pleasure to do this. And if I can help in any way uh, with any resources you need, feel free to contact me.
Many thanks and enjoy the rest of your day or night. Bye-bye.